All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series. Where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Elijah is terrified of going public places without his mom present. The behavior analyst wants to change this, so the analyst schedules routine outings to public places during which the behavior analyst systematically removes the mom more and more from the situation while also providing Elijah with other types of preferred or reinforcing stimuli, including stimuli in the natural environment, for engaging in novel responses in public places. What is the behavior analyst attempting most likely? First things first here. Slow down. When you've got a long, wordy question, we don't get overwhelmed. We don't panic. We just approach it like we would any other question, meaning we're not jumping straight to the answer choices. We need to understand what is the question asking? What is it giving us? Well, it's asking about what is the behavior analyst attempting? So let's look at the behavior analyst in this situation. We know Elijah is terrified of going public places without mom. So the behavior analyst takes the client, Elijah, to public places and then systematically removes the mom more and more while providing Elijah with reinforcing stimuli in the natural environment. So think about all these different approaches and strategies this analyst is using. Ultimately, the analyst is trying to get Elijah more comfortable in public places. The question doesn't say that, but he's taking him to public places. He's removing the mom. That is what the analyst is trying to do. And how is the analyst doing that? Well, Systematically, he's removing the mom, who's removing Elijah's crutch, and then he's reinforcing Elijah, including using naturally occurring stimuli. What the analyst is attempting to do is make this naturally occurring place, this public place, more reinforcing for Elijah. So when we're changing someone's repertoire or we're changing someone's skill set so they're contacting natural environment more, and avoiding punishment more, what are we doing? A, habituation. Be careful. Habituation and habilitation are two different things. Habituation has more to do with respondent behavior, where the repeated presence of a stimulus decreases the reflex or the response to it. And we're not doing or using habituation here. What about B, negative reinforcement? Well, we know the analyst is using reinforcing stimuli, including stimuli in the natural environment. But we're not quite sure if it's negative or positive. So B, we're unclear on. We're not quite sure what type of reinforcement. So what about C, habilitation? Habilitation occurs when a person's repertoire or skill set changes so that they start contacting reinforcement more and they start contacting punishment less. It's exactly what the analyst is attempting to do. They're attempting to change Elijah's repertoire in public places so that Elijah is contacting reinforcement more in this natural environment for engaging in novel responses. Now, what about D, positive punishment? It doesn't mention punishment. It doesn't seem to be there is any punishment present. It seems to be a reinforcement-based approach, which is great. Specifically, the analyst is attempting to get Elijah to change his or her behavior so that they're contacting that natural reinforcement more and more. What is the analyst attempting? C, habilitation. Not the easiest of questions, a long question, a very analytic question. Hopefully you got it right. If not, it's okay. Review it, review it thoroughly, and then continue. You take an art class during your summer break. The class will teach you how to paint portraits. During the class, the art teacher slowly changes the way you grip the brush, move the brush, and apply the paint to your canvas. What is your art teacher doing? So we're looking at the art teacher relative to what it seems like your behavior. What do we know? You, we know you're taking an art class and you're learning to paint portraits. During the class, the art teacher is changing the way you hold the brush, grip the brush, move the brush, and apply the paint. So many, many different aspects of your painting. And so when we are slowly changing or sometimes quickly changing someone's response through approximations, what do we call that? Well, shaping. The art teacher is 
shaping up your behavior. You're going to grip the brush differently. You're going to grip it better. You're going to move the brush differently. You're going to move it better. And you're going to apply the paint differently. You're going to apply the paint better. So we are shaping. We know that. But when we look at A and B, we have two types of shaping. Are we shaping across topographies or within? Well, when we shape across topographies, we're changing the look of the behavior. So if we're changing the way you grip the brush, we're changing the way you move the brush, and we're changing the way you apply paint to your canvas, it means we're changing how your behavior looks. When we shape within a topography, that's when we're already happy with how the behavior looks. We just need to change something about that behavior, some sort of magnitude-related characteristic. And in this case, you're taking this class and you're learning to paint the portraits. You're learning new ways to grip the brush. You're learning new ways to move the brush. You're learning new ways to apply the canvas. We're shaping across topographies. Your topography isn't quite there yet. We need to change much more about your topography than just the magnitude. If the question were to say the teacher is changing how tightly you grip the brush, well, that might be different because your grip might be fine. We're just changing the magnitude. But when we're talking much more of a big picture here, the way we grip it, move it, and apply the paint to your canvas, we're talking much more shaping across topographies. We're not task chaining, obviously, because we don't, we're not discussing task chains here. We didn't do a task analysis. We're not teaching task change. And we're not teaching discreetly. The art teacher is directly teaching you better ways to grip the brush and move the brush the art teacher is directly shaping across your different topographies. Bruce distributes a survey to gather more information regarding the performance of a team of speech therapists. He then presents the team with a set of professional development of videos on teamwork and collaboration. Bruce once again distributes the same survey and then compares the results of the two surveys. What is the independent variable in this scenario? You have to be familiar with independent and dependent variables. The dependent variable, like the name says, is dependent on the independent variable. And the dependent variable is typically our behavior. The independent variable is going to typically be whatever you're introducing or taking away, the intervention. Let's look at this scenario. What do we know so far? Well, Bruce is distributing the survey to look at the performance of a team. He then prevents the team with a set of videos on teamwork and collaboration, and then gives the same survey and compares the results. Think about that for a second. If we're looking for the independent variable, we're looking for what was added, what was taken away, what was the intervention, because we want to see the independent variables effect on the dependent variable. So what in this case was added? Was it the videos? Well, yes. Bruce gives the survey. He then introduces the videos. He then sees how the videos change behavior. He's looking for the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. A looks good. What about B? B, the first survey, or C, the second survey. If anything, C would be our dependent variable if we were looking at the change. The change is really going to be the dependent variable because we're looking at how did the behavior change but it's not our independent variable. We're measuring using the survey. And then the comparison, again, would more likely be the dependent variable. So the independent variable is our video that was introduced. We're now going to look at the comparison of the results to see how the independent variable affected the dependent variable, and we're measuring using these surveys. So what is the IV in the scenario? A, the videos. Ash is reviewing his team's sales number from the fourth quarter of last year. Everybody on the team overperformed compared to the previous quarter, and sales hit an all-time high. But Ash is unsure why. Ash wants to be sure his performance continues into the next year, into the new year. What should Ash do first? This is a personnel management question, and people really struggle with personnel management. I think it's the most requested by far piece in either my teachings or my questions. What you want to do with personal management is to treat it like client management. You're going to establish goals. You're going to do assessments. 
We're going to be reinforced based. Anything we would do for a client, we're going to do for personnel. So in Ash's case, his team performed very well compared to the previous quarter. Ash is unsure why, and he wants to continue the performance. Now, if you had a client and they performed very well in December or January compared to December, and you want January's performance to continue, and you're unsure why they perform better, what's the first thing you would do? Think about it as if you had a client. What would you do first? A, provide a bonus to all employees at his company. One, do we know a bonus is going to change the behavior of every employee at his company? We don't. Ash would need to conduct a preference assessment first. If you had staff at your ABA company, you'd want to conduct a preference assessment before providing reinforcement. So A is skipping some steps. Personnel management is just like client management. B, assess his sales team as a whole to better understand the change in performance. Sure. If you have some clients who are performing well, you don't know why, well, we need to figure out why. That's our entire job as analysts. Why is behavior happening? And so Ash needs to take his whole entire team, do an assessment, and get a better understanding of what changed this performance. The only way to continue the performance is to know what's changing that performance. Say do nothing and monitor the behavior for a few more weeks. If we do this, we might miss the opportunity of identifying what's affecting the behavior in this positive way. And we don't want to do that. We need to figure out why this performance has changed and quickly. D, talk with the two top members of the team only to better understand the entire team's performance. Why would you only talk with two members of the team if you could assess everybody? D is much more indirect than B. And direct assessments are always going to be better than indirect assessments. So given our information, Ash needs to assess the sales team as a whole to better understand the change in performance. Before he does anything else, before he does any bonuses, any reinforcement, any behavior skills tra training, he needs to do an assessment and figure out why exactly the behavior has changed. In this case, it's the behavior changes what Ash wants to see, which is great. Now he needs to figure out why. Although there are disadvantages to discontinuous measurement, there's a time and a place where discontinuous measurement can be useful in service. When might you want to use discontinuous measurement? When might you want to use discontinuous measurement? This comes up a few times where, well, continuous measurement is more accurate. It's, it's typically more reliable. Why would we ever use discontinuous measurement? Well, like anything else, it has a time and a place. And all these different interventions you're learning, these terminologies, these strategies, they all have a time and a place. Everything we do is individualized. And so when something isn't appropriate for one scenario, that doesn't mean it's never appropriate. Discontinuous measurement's a good example. Why would you ever use discontinuous measurement? A, when you have limited time and resources available. Sure, if you can only take data for 20 minutes, that's all the time and resources you have available, well, that data is better than no data. So discontinuous measurement might be applicable there. What about B, when you're measuring the behavior of several learners? Think about planned activity checks or play check. That is exactly what B is talking about, a group discontinuous measurement system. And then C, when the behavior of interest happens very frequently. So if you know that behavior happens all day, every day, is it really necessary to continuously measure it? Maybe not. Maybe a sample is going to tell you all you need to know about the big picture. So A, B, and C are all very relevant times, you might want to use discontinuous measurement. Don't write off interventions just because they don't work in some scenarios. Everything you do needs to be individualized. How are you going to achieve your goal? How are you going to help your client? Analyze the following results from a functional analysis. How could you describe the results? All right, some quick analysis. If you've read Cooper, you might be familiar with this graph. Fantastic. The more familiar you are, the better off you will be. And so when we have our 
functional analyses graph, we can see we have our different conditions. We have contingent escape and free play alone, contingent attention. And we're looking at the number of problem behaviors per minute. And if we look at our data paths, they're all kind of crossing over. Nothing really stands out. So when we were using, or we when we were doing a contingent escape condition, it looks very similar to the attention condition and the alone condition. So when you see a graph like this for functional analyses where everything is kind of crossing over, there's no real clear answer, there are two things you can consider. One, results are inconclusive. And that could be the case. We can't really make a decision here. It all kind of looks the same. Two, we could possibly say it's automatic maintained. We can't say it's attention maintained because attention looks no different than free play, which looks no different than escape. So you can either say it's possibly automatic maintained because it happens all the time, even in our control condition, or we can say it's inconclusive. How would you describe the results giving our answer choices? D, possible automatic maintained. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study material. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.